It is no doubt that The Incredibles is a masterpiece, one of the best Pixar films ever made and that still holds true today. And what can also be said to be true is that its sequel fails to surpass that in any way instead becoming a perfect failure that is enjoyable but fails overall in continuing such a story. Personally, I don't hate it myself, but I find it hard to justify its existence to afford the story of the original, only 14 years after the first, where most of its problems rely on its villain in fact, Evelyn Dever, a twist villain whose name isn't very subtle at all in the slightest and motivated are pretty lame in comparison to Syndrome. Granted, it's hard to follow such a great antagonist, but they had a decade to think about this and create something different and new because for the most part, the story of The Incredibles 2 is mainly the same as the first, with Elastigirl taking over Mr. Incredibles' role now. Like most of the plot, it consists of a hero being dragged back into the game to recapture the glory days and restore supers in society. With the stay-at-home parent trying to tackle issues with their kids, the villain seeking vengeance against all supers, and then the family going together and rescuing their family member to save the day where everyone is happy. It's literally a rehash on a downgraded scale, at least story-wise, where the greatest achievement of this very film was how good the visuals and animation have come since the original, making it more vibrant and lifelike compared to those earlier days of crude animation, and I really like that style choice that they did. However, that doesn't excuse the fact that it's an incredibly lame story with other poorly designed superheroes. As we all know in the original, the majority of supers were wiped out by Syndrome, and now you have to bring in these rejects into the the fold, and I really don't like their designs very much. It just feels very off from what we've seen so far with the pictures of the originals and the Incredibles family, and I don't see how that matches with those two worlds together. The film also just doesn't touch on the adult issues that the Incredibles brought up in the first place and focuses more on its younger audience rather than trying to accomplish what it did before with its themes showing us the current state of the world that we live in with criticisms of things like insurance company practices or mediocrity in society like school events and graduations of the fifth grade, where now you get none of that where it's just the dad's duty to take care of his kids, with an emotional teenage daughter, a hyperactive boy, and a chaotic baby. Which in fact, I actually do love that part of the movie. I love when you actually have these movies focus on the family because that's what they have all been about. But all of it just feels a little bit slow and minimal compared to what you can experience growing up with the original Incredibles. The great thing about the first film is the fact that it ages better as you age when you first watch it as a kid and now as an adult comparing and contrasting the themes that you didn't understand back then but you do actually now. And like many films that aren't great in quality, it always gets ruined in the beginning, where at first it starts off very strong, immediately coming after the ending of The Incredibles, but then over time gets a little bit more jarring with its actions and is overall disappointing, where villains like the Underminer escape scot-free and that's literally the last we see of him in this entire film. Virtually everything they set up at the end of the first was pointless at this point. This scene also opens like the original where you have this world where heroes try to save the day but then at the end people still blame them where now in the present it hardly makes sense for them to do when they just literally saved the city from syndrome and everything else. That people were literally clamoring for the hero's return which you can also see throughout this film as well with these people in the beginning sets off the wrong tone for the world that was originally built. Blaming them on issues that they couldn't control as there was a guy rampaging throughout the entire city to begin with. But anyways things get back to business for the supers when the heroes get enticed to restore all of supers and society by none other than Saul Goodman himself. Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. Did you know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do. And yes, I was actually very happy boy to see that Bob Odenkirk and Jonathan Banks both starred in this film and actually virtually tying The Incredibles to Breaking Bad from that perspective. And of course, I actually appreciate what they added to the film. However, I do not appreciate the background of both Winston Dever and his sister Evelyn as the motivation for them with either Winston restoring heroes or just trying to bring them all down in Evelyn's case comes from the fact of the night where the parents got robbed. How the background of their father was one of the biggest super fans in the world who did his utmost to support them, where he decided to call his direct line to the supers but no one answered because they were just made illegal, and because of that he was shot and killed. And that, my friends, is actually one of the lamest tragic backstories I've ever witnessed on screen, where even Evelyn herself points out later in the film how stupid that was, but actually still launches a plan to ruin supers' reputation and keep them illegal forever. Something that ends up being more lame of a reason for her villainy than what happened to her father, which her 
goals is in fact just a minuscule version of Syndrup's own goals, wanting to rid the world of supers to show how we don't need their powers to help ourselves. I get what they're trying to say by how their father's over-reliance on supers got him killed, but the reasoning and divide between these two are a bit childish, how Winston cannot see a bigger picture by saying supers can solve most of our problems, or just Evelyn being a petty woman for one mistake her father made and just taking it all out on the rest of supers because of how reliant society has become on them to save the day, when they didn't even have the power to do any of that in the first place. It just makes for a much weaker villain when the first one had better motivations where he actually had his dreams ruined directly by his idol, how we saw Syndrome get rejected by Mr. Incredible himself and how that actually directly impacted his upbringing and attitude against supers, becoming more of a bigger threat because of how many he killed. Once again, remind you in the case of Evelyn, she is just petty. She doesn't want to kill them but just humiliate them and that's virtually it. But moving forward in the film, we see here that they do want to use Helen this time to take the role that Bob had in the first film, to make it her chance to shine where she already played this stay-at-home mom role and now they can allow Bob to take over that role instead. And this is the part of the film where you can really tell how much they copied the basic plot from The Incredibles in this situation, where she is successful the first time but finds out there is a lot more than meets the eye, uncovering the great conspiracy that led them both to the main villain. But the biggest difference here is the fact of the role of Bob. We didn't see much that happened to Helen and the kids and their dynamic, where now we get to see Bob try to tackle that certain problem to the best of his ability, being the strong man dad who usually doesn't take care of the house and stuff like the, a mom would usually do. And we do actually see him struggle with that fact, like discovering how Violet's date Tony Reidinger got his memory wiped out by Rick because of the laws and stuff that makes people misremember supers, which actually makes her upset and his job a lot harder. But not as hard as discovering that Jack-Jack actually has powers, multiple powers that is. So at least you can give the movie credit for expanding upon the kids and Bob's role in that. But then again, they did in this very moment virtually regress characters like Violet in this film, which still plays in how the plot is vaguely similar to the first by having her go back to her emo phase because they erased her crushed memories, and really didn't even think twice about furthering her character from where we left her off by the end of the film. She may dress different in this film from where she left off, but she is virtually the same depressed kid that actually gone through the first story and just doing it all over again, where by the end of it she virtually becomes undepressed. Really, nothing to this story is really innovating at all. And of course, by focusing a large part on this side of the story, the movie becomes a bit more slow. The vibrant dark action that was present on the island during the events of the first is not there anymore and the stakes behind the grand reveal are not grand in any way. And going back to talking about the supers I talked about earlier and their horrendous designs, they don't really do much. Most of the time that they are in the film, they actually get mind control for over half their screen time and don't really get a chance to do much useful other than that with their powers. And they do things like focus on this character Void who actually looks up to Elastigirl, but there isn't really much to focus on her or her development frankly. There just isn't enough background for them to be explored or to see what motivates them, where despite minimal involvement from heroes like Gazer Beam in the first, you get to know their backgrounds in civilian life and in super life that led to the clues of Kronos for Mr. Incredible, where now you have this replaced by F-tier superheroes that don't really add much to the story. They are just there to say that hey, there's other supers who are willing to get back in the game and save the day once again. This is also the part where Elastigirl actually got smart like Bob and finally realized what is happening behind the scenes and see that, to no surprise as we discussed earlier, she sees that Evelyn Dever is the most horribly named plot twist villain ever created, who reveals to her how much she's going to uphold the law that is currently standing to stop heroes from becoming legal ever again by embarrassing them through mind control. The only reason I see her doing all of this is because of how stubborn she perceives her brother who is the head of the company they run, where she is only the brains of the operation and has to follow his direct orders to get things done and the only way to accomplish her very goals at the very least is to do mind control. And at least now, this is where things start to ramp up in action, where Bob goes out and gets captured and now the kids have to save the day after being attacked and saved by Frozone who sacrifices himself for their escape to find the truth. This is the part of film that puts all the hopes in the kids to save everyone, which they will actually find to be relatively easy, and one where Evelyn plans to use her mind control supers to ruin their reputation, where somehow in this part she actually overlooked the fact that there appears to be other supers on the ship not controlled, as well as a bunch of people who could have guessed something was actually wrong with their goggles, where somehow, actually in this scene, no one actually gives a second thought to why the fact they are wearing these blue goggles right now when they are actually signing this treaty, where it seems like there is also another overlooked fact that Evelyn failed to notice that they are actually going to ratify this agreement. They actually sign the agreement right then and there, which virtually makes it hard for her plans to actually succeed because they already did this, which by this point 
actually made supers legal again. And her plan only hinges on them making this big mistake to have the yacht crash into a building or whatever. And you could see that nothing here just ever made sense to begin with. Because after all, the kids are finally successful in stopping her plans with ease where everyone else was hypnotized and this is where the tides virtually change and the plan virtually ruined for her. So despite everything working against the clock to save people on the boat and the part of the city, this part actually kind of feels lackluster knowing that she actually failed in her mission much earlier than Syndrome did who actually threatened a city with an omnidroid under the guise of being a hero himself. Because here she just tries to escape dragging her brother along who realizes her evil ways and jumps down and then switches her plans to try to kill Elastigirl this time by leaving her in the plane but that also fails and she jumps and then she falls from the plane and then Elastigirl saves her and the yacht and the people are finally saved. Where we finally notice that Evelyn actually also doesn't learn her lesson being completely ungrateful for the fact her life was actually saved by Super because well she just needs to retain the type of evil traits to make her a villain. And like the first film, the day is finally saved and everyone is happy and they go off to do more superhero stuff by the end of the film. The difference here is that all supers are officially made legal again. But as you can see here, none of the story is really innovative at all. It's more like a soft reboot that's upgraded visually but downgraded story-wise. We don't get much of the same adult tones or themes that were presented to us in the beginning and it just becomes more of a regular family kids adventure that most people would think these films represent in the first place. And that's actually not what The Incredibles are supposed to be about. They're actually supposed to represent a greater sense of family and the influence that society has around it. Where it actually does have some in this film but not to the great extent that was tackled from before that makes you think back on it when you're much older, where you can say, hey, I get what this means now. I get the adult themes that this Pixar film was actually teaching me. What actually would have been more preferable to this story is focusing on the threat of the Underminer and the stuff that he would cause, or more importantly, just have a better villain with different motivations that would raise the stakes much higher in a world that ended where supers were seemingly accepted back into society. I just feel like they could have done much better to make the story different than what they went for by doing the same exact thing as the first, which all virtually made this more of your basic movie, where it doesn't do too much or too little and just serves to fulfill your popcorn needs and that's basically it. And like I said earlier, I still enjoy this film for being that kind of movie that is just fun and whatnot, but it will never come close to matching what The Incredibles made me feel or that era of Pixar films that did something quite unique that I haven't still felt today from anything that Disney has produced overall. The Incredibles 2 is an incredibly mediocre story that is just there to watch and have a good time. And with that said, I'm all done, so goodbye.